नमस्कार सर नमस्कार नमस्कार रेस्पेक्टेड एडवोकेट जनरल एंड फॉर्मर हेड एंड डीन प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद्र बड़पत्रा गोहैन सर डॉक्टर रेहाना माधव कॉर्डिनेटर ऑफ दिस सेशन ऑन लेट प्रोफेसर नॉर्डन संजुबा मेमोरियल लॉ लेक्चर सीरीज फैकल्टी मेंबर ऑफ एन ई एफ लॉ कॉलेज स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ एन ई एफ लॉ कॉलेज डिग्नेटरीज हु हैज ज्वाइन दिस सेशन फ्रॉम ऑल कॉर्नर ऑफ द इंडिया all the dear participants technical staff and organizing team a good morning to all of you i am privileged today to be a speaker on this vital issue of appointment of judges as well as independence of judiciary before i start with my deliberation i just want to share my experience with professor sanazuba sir in my lifetime i had interacted only for four times with him and that too while uh, registering myself for phd at guwahati university whenever i saw him he always invited in me in his room offered chair and then said yes now you can speak how can i help you he was a human rights activist in two sense he was a member of the panel who have interviewed at the time of my phd registration i cannot forget him so learned person luminary of northeast india well known person of northeast i give my tribute to him humble obeisances to late professor n sanazuba sir you will always be remembered and be remain in heart your thoughts your wisdoms expressed in the books will always remain immemorial time and immemorial now i am starting with my lecture i am sharing my screen so now just tell me that the screen is getting shared or ma'am can you see the screen yes yes it is visible sir okay thank you so this is the topic which i have chosen the nf law college has provided me to speak on the independence of judiciary and appointment of judges in india and i am going to talk from the inception of how the, the process by which the appointment of judges was getting discussed that how the judges can be appointed in india how the development has occurred and collegium system has come into existence and then it has moved to commission level and in real sense if we have to think over do we need collegium system do we need a commission model in india so what is the expectation what are indian constitution states can we beyond can we go beyond what the constitution norms has provided the mandate has stated so let us discuss about it first of all the independence of judiciary is not a new concept but its meaning is still growing it is imprecise the starting and the focal point of the concept is apparently the doctrine of separation of power this is the separation of power we can which you can refer from article 50 of the indian constitution primarily it means the independence of judiciary from the executive as well as the legislature the independence of judiciary does not mean just the creation of an autonomous institution which will be free from the control of control as well as the uh, you know influence of the executive and the judiciary rather the underlying purpose of independence of judiciary is that the judges must be able to decide 
a dispute before them according to the law as well as not influenced by any factor this is the core of it and those factors those factors rather it is evolving it is changing depending upon the you know economic sure rule of law realize the human rights and also the prosperity and stability of we can say that independence of judiciary can be assured first and foremost by the constitution and it may also be assured through the legislation conventions and other suitable norms and uh, practices the constitution of india or the foundation law on judiciary are however only the starting point in the process of securing the independence of judiciary ultimately the independence of judiciary depends on the totality of the favorable environment and such favorable environment can be created not not only by the act of the participation of the they are part of constitutional duties as well then only you can have the independence of judiciary there should not be encroachment upon the powers of one another rather than performance of their constitutional duty which has been assigned by the constitution and utmost the public opinion the united nation has laid down the basic principles on the independence of judiciary which can be called as a minimum standards for ensuring the independence and effective functioning of the judiciary those are the judicial independence requires the constitutional recognition guarantee respect and observance it it entails the non interference in the judicial process and legal allocation it also says that that uh, it uh, uh, requires that a competent independent and impartial judiciary to conduct its proceedings and render its decision impartially on the basis of established facts material and in accordance with the law it also states that the judicial selections judicial selections appointment promotion of the member of the judiciary should be based on the integrity competence merit experience the tenure of the office of the judges must be guaranteed by the constitution itself or the law of the land. there must be immunity granted to the judges from the civil liability and then comes accountability and disciplinary sanction mechanism which must be fair transparent with this what the un basic principle has laid down we can find all this combination in our indian constitution the term independence of judiciary i mean that this term if you can club together what you can have you can have judiciary which is an organ of the government and this organ of the government is having a primary function of adjudication independence here means which refers the judicial independence which can come only when you will have the uh, individual independence of the judges as well as institutional independence of the judiciary this institutional independence of judiciary is also called as collective independence of the judiciary further this individual independence of judiciary can be <laughs> hello yes this guy yeah the independent sorry the individual independence of the judges is can it can be further classified as personal independence which means adequate security of the judicial term of the office of the judge 
their remuneration, their transfer, their pension, their entitlement, it must be secured by the constitution and there should not be any interference by the uh, executives or the other machinery. Next is substantive or it is also called as decisional independence. Means subjection of a judge to no authority other than the law. When the judges they are making the judicial decision and exercising the official duties, they must be only subjected to the law and no other authority. Therefore, their decision must be impartial in nature. And internal independence, now this is very important. This is very important. We have to keep in mind that independence of individual judges also includes independence from their judicial superior and the college. There should not be any kind of a, a influence, interference from the senior judges using their administrative power or the control. And accordingly, the subordinate judges should not grant the decision. Now, when, when the uh, uh, constitution was getting drafted, the Sapu committee in 1945, they have recommended on the same line what we are having in the Indian constitution under article 124 and 271. But the committee, but there was a, a, another committee which is called as the Const, uh, Constituent Assembly at Hawk Committee on Supreme Court, which has lays down that there should be a committee of nine members who must submit the names of the judges and then president can appoint from them. So there was a diversion of opinion when the constitution, when there was a debate was going on in the constitution. To find a middle way or to, to just to resolve this conflict, BR, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar who was a real terms, the legal engineer. He said that, I quote him, it seems to me in the circumstances in which we live today, where the sense of responsibility has not grown to the same extent to which we find it in the United States. It would be dangerous to leave the appointment to be made by the president alone. Kind of a remote. There should be a reservation or limitation. That is to say, merely on the advice of the executive of the day. Similarly, it seems to me that to make every appointment which the executive wishes to make subject to concurrence of the legislature is also not a very suitable provision. He also not in favor of subjecting the appointment of judges to the concurrence of the Chief Justice of India. He opined that Chief Justice of India is also a human being, after all, liable to error, and vesting such a power singularly on him would not be desirable. But the Constituent Assembly, all of them have agreed on one point, that there must be independence of judicial. On this point, there was a no debate. They all, there was an unanimous, you know, agreement that yes, the constitution must provide, it must have the independence of judicial. So what they said, that they arrived that there should not be absolute power to the constitutional functionary, either in the hand of CGI or the president. And therefore, the middle way has been adopted, which is called the consultative process among the constitutional functionaries. And therefore, the same you can find in the appointment of the Supreme Court judges under Article 124 and the appointment of High Court judges under Article 217 of the Indian Constitution. Now, till, uh, till 23 years of the passing of the Indian Constitution, the judicial appointments were made through the process which were provided under Article 124 and to 17 of the Indian Constitution in the spirit of constant assembly, what they have said. The appointment of judges were made with the consultative process and the appointment of CJ was hardly avoided. The seniority 
the senior most judge of the supreme court was favored to be the cgi and the executive the president respected the constitutional convention of appointing the senior most judge but now from here the controversy has started it i can see that yes it has been it has been seen in the year 1973 april the date is very important 25th april 1973 justice a n ray he was appointed as the cgi superseding the three senior most judge those were justice k shankar manilal shala justice k s hegre justice k n grove what was the reason that a n ray was superseded three senior most judges why the president why the executive has done away with the earlier constitutional convention of appointing senior most judges so the conflict between the judiciary as well as the executive is apparent now it seems to be apparent on face of it now why it has happened just one day before the appointment of n ray was done on 25th of april on 24th of april 1973 a historic judgment was passed in the case of keshavananda bharati keshavananda bharati was passed on 24th april 1973 and just look after who were the judges this was the case which was decided by 13 constitutional bench nine of the judges have given the judgment in favor and four judges they were they have given they have given the dissenting opinion now here i have marked it in the red you can see on the 10th position justice an ray was there justice an ray superseded jm salat ks agre an grover why why the why the government has chosen to do such kind of a thing it is having the the reason is you can find in the case itself keshavanand bharati case has restricted the power or you can say that it has put a wider restriction limitation on the power of the parliament to amend the constitution earlier the golaknath case was there golaknath case has said that this parliament is having a power to amend the constitution but the part 3 fundamental right cannot be amended but keshavanand bharati has said that parliament can amend the entire constitution they are having the power and the procedure is there to amend the constitution but keshavanand bharati laid down the basic structure doctrine and said that parliament can change the constitution they can amend the constitution but without without touching the basic without destroying the basic structure of the constitution and in that judicial review is the basic structure independence of judiciary is the basic structure so what the government has not want is uh, you know desired or the desired result was not given by the judiciary the result has been this was not the only case subsequently also the same incident can incident has been followed in the year 1977 justice h r khanna was superseded by justice m h beg m h beg again you can find m h beg he was there on the 12th number of providing the dissenting opinion in keshavanand bharati case he was he was preferred to be cgi and justice h r khanna has not been given the chance to be the cgi reason reason of his his, his is anything opinion sorry his judgment in adian chapter of the way in which he has gone against the government saying that that you cannot curtail the freedom the right to access to justice even during the emergency period the result is this. so the tussle the conflict between the judiciary and the executive it has become apparent it has it has become you know everyone can see it that yes for these institutions by so not directly but 
in action it can be seen the first case not directly it has been called as a uh, judges case but even before the sp gupta the sh sankar uh, sakal chand justice sakal chand h seth versus union of india that has came in the year 1976 this case has came because there was a mass transfer of high court judges and among them justice sakal chand was also sakal chand he claimed that that he was transferred from gohat from uh, gujarat high court to andhra pradesh without taking his consent he also contended that that the transfer was without the consultation of the chief justice of india in this case there was a five judges and three is to two the judge the judgment was given case has been decided in the fashion that that no transfer without consultation of the cgi can be done so consultation must be there and consultation does not mean concurrence this case has given primacy not to the cgi but to the executive that president is not bound by the recommendation given by the chief justice of india he can even do away with means the president can deny reject the recommendation of cgi in this case justice bhagwati while writing the dissenting in opinion he is he has referred here that consent must be there before transferring a charge because what you are doing you are trying to interfere in his personal independence so transfer must be in consultation means the consent of the judge must be obtained before he has been transferred or the option must be it must be you know, received from his uh, from the concerned judge now the first case case of sp gupta versus union of india now again this case was involved with regard to the appointment and transfer of judges and the question of independence of judiciary in this case there was a contention this case has sp gupta he was the innermost judge of the allahabad high court and he has challenged the validity of the central government orders for non appointment of two judges two additional judges they have not been given uh, permanency though the vacancy was lying this petition petition in this petition the petitioner even he has shot the disclosure of correspondence between the law minister the chief justice of delhi and the chief justice chief justice of india means that that when there was a consultation process was going on between the constitutional commissioner then do can that document file noting can be shared the state has claimed the privilege the state they have claimed the privilege against this document under the article 74 of the indian constitution 74 clause 2 and section 123 of the indian evidence act now what was the decision decision is very important though sp gupta was partly overruled in the subsequent case but this case has laid the foundation of collegium system this case has acknowledged the independence of judiciary and that too the independence of judiciary as a basic structure of the constitution so right from the very beginning when the constitution assembly was you know they were debating well, on it the from there from there up to sp go so that yes independence judiciary is a basic good now bhagwati this is bhagwati being the uh, you know deciding upon this issue he rejected the government's claim oh, of protection on the disclosure 
on the disclosure of those documents containing the correspondence and directed the Union of India, directed the government to disclose it. He was of the opinion that if you have an open and, and uh, you know, effective uh, participatory de democracy, then you must have openness. You must provide access to the, info uh, in to the information to the public. You must receive the accountability. You must say that, yes, there must be an accountability. Accountability will come only when someone will ask you. Someone will not ask you unless he is having any information. So the public, he has given importance to the public opinion. To the public. All these constitutional machineries, they are also responsible towards the public. So with respect to the contention, which involved in Article uh, 74, Clause 2, the court held that while the advice of the Council of Ministers, which was given to the President, no judicial is there. But the correspondence which was received between the Law Minister, Chief uh, Justice uh, of Delhi, Chief Justice of India, that was not protected. And those advices must be, must be put in the public token. It must be provided a proactive information must be or proactive disclosure must be made. In this case, it was also said that the, there can be a two ground on which the central government decision can be challenged with regard to appointment and transfer. The one is that there was no full effective consultation between the central government and the appropriate authority. And the decision was based on irrelevant grounds. These are the two grounds which was let down. Now, very important, the last line you can refer to. The court retreated its Sakal Chand position. Sakal Chand, just now we have discussed. Position that there must be effective consultation between all the constitutional functionaries, but consultation does not mean concurrent. It does not mean that the president is bound by the president is bound by the recommendation given by the CGI. And majority did not agree that the CGI had any primacy or veto in this regard. Now in this case, SP Gupta only Justice Bhagwati, he has recommended that there should be a board. There should be a board who will con who will have a consultation with the CGI and give the names or who will recommend the names for the appointment of judges. So this concept of board collegium that was actually it was it has got germinated. It was tabled by Justice Bhagwati in the case of S. P. Gupta. I am hearing another voice. I am hearing other voice. I am could not able to concentrate. Participants Mike are requested to mute their microphone. All the participants are requested to please mute your microphone. Background noise no. is coming. You can refer everywhere that that the collegium system was uh, judicial interpretation has led to you know um, uh, led to give birth of collegium system in the case of Supreme Court in second judges case. But let me tell you frankly, Justice Bhagwati, he was the first person who tabled, though he has not named it as a collegium, but he tabled with the term called board, who must be consulted by the CGI while forming the opinion who is the best person who to discuss about the merit of the person who can be best in the opinion of the Chief Justice to be recommended, recommended as a person to be appointed as Judge of the High Court or the Supreme Court. Now the, it comes the second judge case, that is the Supreme Court Advocates on Record versus Union of India, 1994. So in this case, the S. V. Gupta case, uh, S. V. Gupta judgment was partially, partially it was overruled. As far as the disclosure, disclosure of information and. Uh, uh, what the central government has guarded, guarded their information under Article 70, 74, Clause 2, Section 123 of the Evidence Act. 
that was left as it is. But about the primacy position of CGI, that was over. In this case, again the court has the, ju the judges has retreated the independence of judiciary as a basic structure. The court has said that there must be integrated participatory consultative process. Now, this is you know what you know uh, I can say that court has tried to lay down this term has been used, which means that that for selecting the best and most suitable person who are available for appointment, all the constitutional functionaries must perform this duty collectively, uh, collectively, with a view primarily to reach an aggregate decision subserving the constitutional purpose, so that the occasion of primacy does not arise in the matter of appointment of that is of the Supreme Court or the High Court. Therefore, there must be integrated participatory consultative process between all the constitutional machine. The court, you know, uh, has said that the primacy of the opinion of the Chief Justice of India means the recommendation of the Chief Justice of India is not only consultative in nature, it is having the concurrence, the effect of concurrence. It must be taken into consideration. I can say that, that the binding nature, binding nature of the recommendation given by the CGI to the executive as far as the appointment of judges are concerned has been made in this case. CGI must be given primacy. And court has laid down certain guidelines. The guideline, the first is that the CGI opinion must be given primacy, but he must be, he must consult with his two senior most colleagues. So when you look after the uh, black letter of Indian Constitution, Article 124 and 217, you will find that the president may consult the CGI and other judges as it deems necessary. But here, the compulsion has been provided. The judiciary has created a combination of judges that is called the college. The form, the board has been formed. What the uh, Justice Bhagwati has referred in SP Gupta, board, collegium, a group of individuals must be consulted. So consultation was again, and the primacy position was given to the CGI. It has been said that the transfer of judges cannot be challenged. So non no, justiciability to the transfer of judges. Proposal of uh, for the appointment of judges must be initiated by the Chief Justice of India for the Supreme Court judges and by the Chief Justice of High Court for the Court of the High Court. And the opinion of the Chief Justice has not merely primacy, but is a determinative in the matter of transfer of the high court judges and the chief judges. And in making all the appointments and transfer, the norms indicated must be followed. In the next case of in V presidential reference, now in the year 1999, the president of India referred under Article 143 of the Indian Constitution, the matter before the uh, Chief Justice, taking his opinion, the advice, the matter was referred. The matter was referred regarding that what is the law, the clarification, because the uh, judiciary is having a power to interpret the law. So the president has referred the matter to the CGI to give, uh, you know, clearance, uh, clarification. As far as GSP Gupta and uh, uh, Supreme Court advocates on record cases are there, first case, judge case, and second judge case. And here the court has laid down again, they have retreated what has been laid down in the case of uh, uh, second judge case. But little bit, you know, deviation is there again. 
or I can say that in re-presidential reference case, the collegium system has more made more stronger by including more people within it. The consultation with the Chief Justice of India requires consultation with plurality of the judges in the formation of the opinion of the Chief Justice and that the number has increased from two to four. So the Chief Justice of India must make recommendation to appoint a judge of the Supreme Court and transfer of Chief Justice with consultation of four senior most judges of the Supreme Court. And when the appointment has been made at the High Court, then two senior most judges of the Supreme Court must be consulted. The CGI opinion, <clears throat> the CGI must consult, the consultation is a must. He cannot decide the matter individually. So the check on the appointment of judge is become, you know, consultation. Though it is coming from the collegium. So consultation with the collegium system that has become the sine qua non for the appointment of judge. After that, after 1999, <clears throat> you can see that even at the back, backdrop of it, the development was going on. In 121st Law Commission report, which was made in uh, 1987, they have started you know, recommending that against the college system, they started creating a structure that there should be some body, there should be some committee, there may, there may be some board, and that must be that that must have a combination of judiciary as well as executive or to some extent even the legislature so law commission has recommended that that there must be cgi as a chairman the senior most judge of the supreme court and the immediate even the retired cgi immediate immediate retired cgi they can also be included so this particular part you can see that it is not only the law commission report but uh, National Commission, who, uh, who review to working of the Constitution, National Council to review the working of Constitution in 2002, National Advisory Council 2005, and Second Administrative Reform Commission 2007. All of them have tried. Those all of them have recommended that there must be some independent appointment commission which must have some combination of judiciary as well as the executive bodies in the process of appointment of judges. And then comes the National Judicial Appointment Commission <clears throat> Act of 2014. 14th Lok Sabha, after the 14th Lok Sabha, National Advisory Council, they have prepared a concept paper on the National Judicial Commission, which was tabled before the Rajya Sabha and the Parliament and got passed. It was tabled in the form of Constitutional 99th Amendment Act of 2014, as well as National Judicial Appointment Commission Act of 2014. It was uh, received the assent of the President on 31st December and became the Act become applicable, applicable act from 13th April 2015. And the moment it has been notified by the government, this act has received challenge. The act has received the con, uh, challenge as far as its constitutional validity is concerned. So before looking after what was the challenge to this particular you know, enactment, let us see what changes this constitutional amendment and the act has brought this. So the Constitutional Amendment Act, <clears throat> it has brought the commission having the six members. So Article 124A, B, and C was inserted. Article 124A, it has listed six number of persons, Chief Justice of India, two senior most judges of the Supreme Court, the Union Law Minister, and Justice. And two eminent, sorry, two eminent persons nominated by the committee and the committee comprising of Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, 
and if suppose the, there is a no leader of opposition then the largest you know, leader of the single largest party all these persons so the commission which was uh, you know uh, brought into existence by the constitutional 99th amendment act it talks about the national judicial appointment commission which is comprised of six members functions 124b was provided and the power to make law under article 124c by excise of article the power you know uh, mentioned in article 124c the act of 24 2014 was enacted this act njac act it was having in total 14 sections surprisingly i will refer to the section harassment act in the object clause of the vishakha case you can find reference of cedo international student in the object clause itself now here in the object clause of the act it was to regulate the procedure to be followed by the njac for recommending persons for appointment transfer of judges and the matter connected and incidental there to no reference of independence of the judiciary was mentioned moreover section 5 it pro provide procedure for selection of judges of the supreme court the commission shall recommend the appointment of senior most judges so as far as what we have seen in uh, at the time of um, uh, keshwananda bharti case at the time of uh, after uh, passing of adm jabalpur case the most judges has not been uh, given the chance to be the to preside over this position of cgi at least that part has been given a due consideration and it has been settled by the law that senior most judge of the supreme court must be appointed must be considered if he is fit to hold the office and the person shall not be because it's of uh, six members commission so what will happen if there is a you know tie as far as recommending the name of the person three person in favor and three persons not in favor then what will happen act is side but one thing the act has stated there in that if the person shall not be recommended for appointment if any two of the members of the commission do not agree for such recommendation do this particular line is having any impact if two of the members of the commission if they do not agree on such a recommendation then national judicial appointment commission shall not recommend the name of such judges for the Now just go through with the, you know, I'm just backing, going back. So here you can see, from the judiciary there are three persons, PGI, and two senior most judges of the Supreme Court, three persons. And who are the other three persons? Union Minister of Law and Justice, one. Two eminent persons nominated by the committee comprising of Prime Minister. cgi and the leader of opposition party so suppose i'm just giving one you know uh, illustrate illustration before all of you that suppose the union minister executive the position is the executive union minister he does not agree and because two eminent persons is required to be nominated by the committee comprising of prime minister cgi and leader of opposition and suppose any member of the three uh, other two members if they are also not agree means three members who are not the judge in straight forward i can say that that they are in this committee in this uh, commission there are three members from the judiciary and three members who are outside from the judiciary so if members who are outside the judiciary if they are not agree no recommendation can be given and if the members from outside the judiciary they are agreeing on the they are agreeing on the recommendation if be the judiciary the members from the judicial side they may not agree 
still no recommendation. So still it can be seen from this you know, legislation. Now this act was challenged before the Supreme Court. Supreme Court advocates on record for the Union of India 2015, this case was not came. And by 4 is to 1, the 99th constitutional amendment, including the NJSC Act of 2014, was struck down as unconstitutional because it's a violation to uh, independence of judiciary doctrine, doctrine of separation of power. And moreover, the judicial, sorry, uh, independence of judiciary has been seen from the point of view of judicial primacy. That is also the part of the basic structure that was there. Even collegium allows the executive participation while maintaining the judicial primacy to the college. So to prove which both this uh, enactment has come to an end. And the effect of this judgment was that, that what, what was the position before the passing of National Judicial Academy, uh, National Judicial Appointment Commission was there, it will remain the same. So position of third judge, third judge case has been put there on record. So what was decided in second judge's case, that is uh, Supreme Court advocates on record, as well as in re-presidential uh, case, both these decisions still it finds value as far as appointment of the district. Now you can see that that uh, the tussle between the initial tussle was between the executive and the judiciary, which later on it has been seen by making the legislation. The legislature has tried to control the appointment of judges by making this enactment. So. From how you are going to see, do you want to, do you want that there must be a rule of law must prevail? Yes, then the law must be there. It means no one should be, you know, above the law. No one should be above the law, whether it is a judge, whether it is a legislator or the executive. Everyone is working to maintain the rule of law. Another, you know, very important uh, decision which has came in the case of Central Public Information Officer, Supreme Court of India versus Subhash Chandra Garwal in the year 2019. In SP Gupta, the court has said that disclosure of file noting as far as the correspondence between the, the authority like the law minister of Delhi, TJ of Delhi and TJ uh, Chief Justice of India, that must be disclosed. Now here, the RT was filed to the registrar of the Supreme Court. Why? To furnish a copy of complete correspondence which was happened between the uh, Chief Justice of India. As the Times of India has reported that the union minister had approached through a lawyer to Mr. Justice uh, Raghupati of the High Court of Madras to influence the decision. Second RT was filed to, to supply the copy of the papers where the correspondence was exchanged between the concerned constitutional you know, authorities with the file noting relating to appointment of Justice H.L. Tattu, Mr. Justice A.K. Kanguli, and Mr. Justice R.M. Lodha who have super, superseded the seniority of Mr. Justice A.P. Saha and other two justices. So what was the reason behind it that was even seeked by the RTI? And the Supreme Court has held that the need for judicial independence does not stand in contradiction with that of the transparency. The above information falls under the third party information and the procedure which has been laid down under section 11 of the RTI Act must be followed and information must be provided. Last, the post retirement appointment and independence of the RTI. Do we think that once the judges has retired, they must be forbidden not to get any legislative appointment 
or accept any other you know, chair. Now you can see, as I said, that means there there must be you know internal independency too among the judges. In 1952, when the Justice Fazal Ali was appointed, he was appointed the governor of Odisha, bah Justice Baharul Islam. He was the advocate who contested and become member of the parliament in the Lok Sabha, then again resigned and become the judge of the Guwahati High Court and subsequently to the elevated to Supreme Court and then again become the member of the parliament. So there are a number of incidents. If the fact has revealed that if the judge has passed the order while remaining in, remaining in chair, given the order or decision as desired by the government, then such judges has been given an order subsequently after the order. And if the judges has not acted as per the desired uh, you know, desirability of the government, then even their tenure has been kept in state. Now, as of a law student, in the beginning itself, I have said that the, even the independence of judiciary is, is still evolving. It's still it's rolling to you know find its maturity level. Regarding the appointment of judges in the other countries, they are having the amalgamation of, uh, you know, judiciary, legislative, or the executive as far as the appointment of judges is concerned. But in India, the judiciary itself has created a guard from outside encroachment, and within that guard itself, again they have created a, another shell in the name of college. I think till the transparency can be maintained, till the openness can be maintained, till the public opinion can be given more emphasis compared to all these things, I think there is no harm. But when the openness has been diminished, when there is a, you know, something to hide. Hide means either there is an arbitrariness or there is a chance of corruption. So from all these things, I think our legal system is facing this challenge. And uh, from the time inception of, you know, making this constitution, it's still it was in discussion before the constitution was framed it was in discussion after the constitution was framed it's still in it, uh, it is in discussion and i think it will go on in, in discussion until until we'll found, we will find a solution to it because more hiddenness if there is no openness it means there is a erosion of faith in the judiciary too. We cannot, we cannot say, at this particular juncture, we cannot say that there is a no erosion in the faith of judiciary. Judiciary has been declared as a guardian to the fundamental rights, guardian to the constitution, constitutional values, if they have acted. Collegium system was started by the judiciary itself. Otherwise, in the constitution, the consultation, the president may consult only the CGI. Then why there is a demand, why there was a request to even to consult the other two judges and then furthermore four other judges? Because might be there is some distrust within the judges. It has to be taken care of. So with this, I acknowledge the work of Professor MP Singh who has written a very good article securing the independence of judiciary, the Indian experience, and another, Dr. Anubhag Deep and Mbhavi Mishra, Judicial Appointment in India and NJAC Judgment, Formal Victory or Legal Defeat. I even request all of you to go through with these documents. It's a very valuable document. It's very enlightening. With this, 
I end my speech and I open this forum for questions if you have. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your invaluable speech and uh, thought provoking information. I hope that our students. Uh, they have uh, understood many uh, legal points from your uh, deliberation and they are ready with the question. Now the platform is open for the interactive session and uh, I invite uh, Fibankar Pashwar. I call upon Fibankar Pashwar to continue with this interactive session. Fibankar, are you there? Fibankar? Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, 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 you are able to do that. Okay. Uh, very thank you, Dr. Rehana, ma'am. And before we start off this interactive session, I would just humbly like to thank the, our dignitaries, our <clears throat> resource person for today with their present and enlighten each of us with your insightful knowledge. And I also like to thank our principal, sir, for and the IQ AC cells of NEF Law College for taking this initiative in conducting these Friday lecture series. Uh, I also humble my uh, like to offer my gratitude to the NEF and Law Administration and all the participants and my fellow colleagues who are present in this web, uh, lecture series today. So to start off with the session, I assume many of you might have your question. So you can all, all the participants are kindly requested to kindly refer to the chat box and I will like, I will transfer those questions to, to our resource person for today. So sir, yeah, sir, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Priya Ranjan Kumar, sir, the first question which I have received is from uh, Meena Madhu Rima Barwa. She has asked why NJAC is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Why See, NJAC yeah. is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? Okay, yes. Let me continue. See, before I, uh, you know, I start in you know, speaking on this uh, question. Let me tell you the intent of the Constitution. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. We, can, we, are, we are able to whether, whether the fundamental right is important or the, uh, the directive principle of the state policy is important. Now, if you'll see from the constitutional perspective, if you'll see from the constitutional perspective, you can find that, that the fundamental rights are negative rights and directive principle of state policies are positive rights. Each state, while making any legislation, they must keep in mind the, the directives which has been given by the Constitution, Part 4. And Article 50 itself says that, that the judiciary must be, there must be separation of judiciary from the executive. That is the demand, that is the you know, goal which has to be achieved. Even when the judiciary itself has declared that separation of power is a basic structure, then the law must be made to, to promote independence of judiciary. The law must be made to minimize the interference of executive in the judicial affair. If you see the Method, the method by which the law was passed, or if you go through the content of it, as I referred to section 5 of the act, the combination, the way in which it has been made, like six members, and it has been given veto to two members, that if two members object to the appointment of you know, judges, then the recommendation cannot be given, cannot be given. So who are these two persons? Have you ever came across with uh, any you know, instances where the, chief, the CGI or Chief Justice of India, after consulting their collegium, they have not recommended the names of the judges for elevating to the judge of the Supreme Court? 
but that will happen that will happen if executive will be given more see constitution has tried to create a balance between the executive and judiciary i think no one is allowed to fall play with it clearly it has stated that the president is having a power so under the hand and the seal of the president the appointment must be done and beyond president now uh, judiciary has created a collegium now the government is creating another commission but we are trying what we are trying to achieve are we trying to achieve the independence of judiciary are we trying to achieve a legal system which must be based on the rule of law or are we trying to show the controlling power upon one to another that because the consultation means that there must be you know agreement there must be a the all the constitutional functionaries they must harmonize they must harmonize their discussion to arrive at a conclusion for the betterment of the system not for detracting the system itself and therefore on the ground that that there is a infringement to doctrine of basic structure separation of power and independence of judiciary this enactment has been struck down as unconstitutional any other question okay thank you sir i hope our uh, student is satisfied with the answer and she is able to clear her doubts uh, yeah, the second question comes from bilkis begum her question is whether judiciary is accountable if so why it is against njac hello sir hey, uh, yeah i got this uh, question uh, thank you for putting this very nice question accountability of judiciary see accountability of judiciary does not depends upon national judicial appointment commission it does not depends upon that can you say that if if suppose that enactment would not had been struck down as unconstitutional then you would had achieved the judicial accountability no accountability comes from the self you know what is your self if you are in the beginning itself i said that if the person is performing the constitutional duties very strictly in his spirit then he will be accountable and he can show that yes he is accountable judiciary is accountable the act which the case which i have referred to all of you which was decided in the year 2019 on the petition filed by subhash chandra agarwal in you can read that judgment in that judgment the court itself has said that the judiciary is accountable if you are not accountable see all the persons are people are keeping faith in the judiciary they are keeping faith in the judiciary that you, they can receive the justice the ultimate delivered in a delivery of justice can be received from the judicial system it is a constitutional machine it must be open must be transparent and when the judicial authority they are discharging their administrative function there are administrative functions legislative functions there are there are the judicial functions when they are discharging their administrative functions they must be transparent in in uh, you know there was a say uh, there was a you know a uh, uh, principle that if an order is a non speaking order then it can be challenged it can be expected principle of natural justice demands that there must be speaking or in administrative law when the judiciary they are discharging their administrative functions with regard to appointment of judges transfer of judges the grounds on which the appointment was done you know very interestingly this uh, 2019 judgment to maintain the judicial accountability the judges has recommended that there must be some standards there must be some formula on which you are going to appoint the judges at the highest level 
and those criteria must be placed before the public platform public must know about what are the criteria which has been taken to consideration for elevating any person to the highest highest in the platform what are the criteria on which the one advocate has been chosen to be made as of a judge of the high court those criteria must be placed in the public so you can see the trend earlier there was a high you can go through with the you know supreme court cases online you can go through with this website home page of supreme court and you can find that from 2017 onwards only i am telling you very clearly from 2017 onwards the website of supreme court of india started maintaining the record of you know reasons why the person has been or the decision of the collegium that has been kept at the website now from 2019 onwards only the statement is coming but yes i totally agree and i you know i can say that yes judiciary has maintained and judiciary can do anything judiciary has itself curtailed its own power i can say and it has you know uh, came forward saying that there must be openness there must be responsiveness there must be accountability and the judiciary is accountable to the people also and therefore the judiciary has said that the criteria must be laid down for the appointment and it must be placed before the public to yes judiciary is accountable. okay thank you Am sir Am I clear uh, to you or yes sir i'm clear and i hope the bilkis begum is also satisfied with your answer so the next question comes from sorabi das she has asked has the supreme court been able to to assert its independence in the face of new found assertiveness again, again, again. I, i got destruction of voice can you please repeat the question i may repeat has the supreme court been able to assert its assertiveness in the face of new found assertiveness exerted by the central government has the supreme court been able to assert its independence in the face of mm. new found assertiveness exerted by the central government hello sir it's a uh, uh, you know long, yeah yeah am i audible yes sir yes am i audible yes sir you clear so uh, it's a very interesting question it's a very interesting question and it's a uh, it will go long it, it will go for a long still many things is yet to come in, in that assertion and yes to some extent the judiciary has succeeded in asserting you know the its own independence of judiciary and let me tell you that uh, uh, it will go with the constitutional amendment and the way in which it was carried out uh, you can read you know 44th constitutional amendment you can read out uh, a 29th constitutional amendment and you will find that yes it was very you know uh, uh, nicely the supreme court has asserted this fact of you know independence of judiciary as and let down as a basic feature and to some extent even the central government has also tried to you know assert this fact of independence of judiciary but still the fight is and more assertion has to come in future and we are waiting for it we are waiting for it okay thank you sir so the next question comes from the uh, is there a possibility that the prevailing system of reemployment of retired ju judges may erode the independence of judiciary is there a possibility that the prevailing system of reemployment of retired judges may erode the judicial independence yes see uh let me tell you one that how we perceive the reemployment of retired judges if we see the system of united states of america the judges are appointed for the long you know they are uh, appointed till their last breath 
the tenure is very secure. Now in India, there is a you know number of instances where the retired judges they have given the they have become the corporate legal advisors. They have become the corporate legal advisors for drafting their uh, agreements, giving them you know uh, legal advisors various matters. They have become legal advisors for number of politicians. Now what will happen? A, a judge of the Supreme Court will always remain a judge of the Supreme Court, even after retirement also. If you see a judge, if you meet out any judge who has retired from his office, are you going, and he, suppose he has got some re-employment, how you are going, how as a person you are going to see that particular person, as a person who has been re-employed on that particular post, or still you will have a kind of you know, faith in him, still you will have a kind of a respect for him as the judge of that particular you know, court. I think to some extent, yes, re-employment of judges, after their their, uh, their retirement, it is one of the factor. It is one of the factor. Again, I'm repeating. It is one of the factor for erosion of faith in judiciary. There must be some some you know there must be some mechanism. There must be the government must come with a mechanism by which such elite person. The person who is so knowledgeable, the person who is well versed with the process to give justice, their services must be utilized for the nation. Their services must be utilized for this country. Their services must be utilized for the poor people. Now, uh, I do have questions to myself. I do have one question to myself that law students when they are studying in their colleges they have been asked to give legal advices legal aid they have to hold a legal aid camp and actively they have to participate in that as of a student you have been asked to provide some social services in the form of to all the needy persons can't the same be made at the behest of uh, the retired judges but what I'm saying that there must be certain machinery, there must be certain mechanism where still their tenure must be put in. That is the demand that the tenure of the judges. Now, institution, we are saying tenure of judges is 65. After that, what? After that, what? So, mechanism must be in, you know, installed so that the services of the retired judges must be arrested. Prevailing situation is that uh, the retired judge can be you know, given some position after retirement at the uh, will of the present government who is in the rule or is in the power. But uh, that mechanism is uh, not, you know, that cannot be worked out for the progressive society. It cannot be worked out for the progressive society. Even Krishna Ayer, he has that means uh, the retired judges uh, or the persons who are going to retire, they must not be worried. The person who are going to retire, they must not be worried about post-retirement benefits. So in judiciary, what is happening that the person must be impartial in their act, but they become more concerned about what they are going to do after retirement. And that, in yes. a way, uh, to some extent, yes. It is also, but I am again repeating it back that it is one of the factor for erosion of the faith of the judiciary. One, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, there's another question from Bharat Bhushan Verma. His question is: While judiciary wants transparency from executives and enforce yes. RTI yeah. for every case. Their own system of selection is totally opaque. Is it fair? Again, can I repeat the question? While judiciary wants transparency from executives and enforce RTI for every case, 
their own system of selection is totally opaque. Is it fair? That's why in 2019, the judiciary itself has it. See, if you read 2019 case, you will find that it's very interestingly, you know, when three RTA application was filed to the Office of Registrar of the Supreme Court of India, they said that we don't have such kind of an office and therefore such application is state probably rejected by the registrar of the Supreme Court. Now you tell me that you are having a CGI office, hmm? Chief, Chief Justice of India office is there and Chief Justice of India is discharging judicial, judicial function as well as administrative function. When he is discharging his administrative function, as of you know, recommending body of appointment of any judges, do it need? Is there any need to maintain a difference or different office compared to the present office of the CGI? Can there be a two offices in the Supreme Court of India for a CGI? No, there can be only one office. Office is same, but there is a multiplication of duties discharged by the total person. But the star of the Supreme Court of India has rejected those RTA applications and see the see the, you know the valuable judgment see the uh, uh, the architecture the structure which has been created by the judiciary itself the judiciary itself is saying in that particular case that yes there must be openness the the, the transparency is required to be maintained who is saying it the judiciary is saying judiciary is saying that even at the time of recommending the name, the grounds, the criteria which has been taken for the uh, elevation, the criteria which has been taken for appointment of the judges must, must be kept before the public trial. So I think judiciary is not only demanding that there must be fairness, openness in the executive function, but even the judiciary is demanding that there must be fairness, openness in the executive function of judicial functionary. Executive function discharged by the judicial functionary. I think Hello. Hello. Information relating to assets of the judiciary, judges. Once the judges they have disclosed the information regarding their assets, can a person have such information? Can you file an RTA to receive such documents? Now the question has been answered by the court in that particular judge is there and you can receive the receive it. So slowly, slowly, I think, because we are moving towards maturity of you know our own democracy and uh, the way in which we will move. See, law cannot be static. Law cannot be static. Though it must be stable, but it cannot remain static. Change has to occur as and when the society is getting changed. The social behavior is getting changed. Huh? According to the law has to change. So earlier you were having a collision system. Now at least you you have seen you have uh, the mirror of a commission system. I think in the times to come, in the recent day, you will have another system. Okay. To perform our duties, that is, why our duties support, support our also. Time and again, when the bill is coming, we are coming with a very own judgment and uh, placing a restriction upon the uh, executive. Rather, it is also placing restriction upon the law and the constitution. Yeah. 
Any other question? Hello, any other okay. question? Yes, sir. Uh, There's one. Yes, sir. I got one question from our faculty, Upasana yeah. Goswami. She has asked, there has been many allegation against the judges to be involved in corruption. Is, this, is it not violation of rule of law? Is it necessary to have particular legislation or, on this so that the confidence of people on the judiciary is not lost? I totally agree with you, ma'am. I totally agree. Corruption is there. Corruption is there. And even the court has also accepted time and again regarding the corruption. And therefore, for, uh, as a is very slow. You can find, see, if you permit me, I can show you the other slides. I can show you the other slides. There you can find that, that as in, with regard to the appointment of judges, there is a tussle between the uh, judiciary and the executive. And regarding the impeachment of judges, now it is a surprising. Regarding the impeachment of judges, you will find that even the judges, Legislatures, they are coming forward to save the judges. So somewhere, some or, or the other round, yes, like, uh, you know, we are having um, Lok, Lokpal Bill, Lokpal, Lok, uh, Lokayutta. In the same way, we are also having Judicial Inquiry Act, inquiry, uh, Judicial Inquiry Act, we are having and the impeachment procedure is also there. Corruption, somewhere, you know, even the violation to human rights is also done by the judges. That those cases are also getting you know, reported. They have been reported earlier also, reported nowadays also, except giving the, uh, you know, without uh, telling the name, the allegation was there upon the CGI also. But the fact was known to fact was known to one. See, when we are talking about openness, when we are talking about transparency, when we are talking about creating certain mechanism for judicial accountability, when we are talking about removal of corruption, when we are talking about instilling, installing, you know, uh, uh, faith in judiciary. One thing is very important: that if you are finding any corruption, mm -hmm. if you have found anywhere violation to human rights is taking place a person a human being a common citizen people must come forward come forward and raise the voice if you are not going to raise a voice nothing will happen if you will not raise a voice nothing will happen now uh, sabri mala case young lawyers you know they have filed a pil they have filed a PIA. Association has filed a PIA. So person has to come forward if you're seeing any you know, corruption anywhere. More strongly, you condemn, condemn those acts. I think more strongly, the matter will be taken into consideration and a process will be you know, devolved so that such acts should not take place in the future. Thank you very much, sir. So it you, was uh, really a very great session, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I ask Thank a you. May I, may I ask a question? Yeah, Dr. please, Kumar. sir. Please, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my privilege. Sir. That I, so, uh, I'll take thank you very much. You. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Really delightful. And uh, what I have observed that you have a very extensive study on this topic. Uh, so far, I remember in S.K. Gupta, uh, Gupta, 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 Gupta case, the, it yes. is probably it is said in the S.K. Gupta case that, uh, that the, there is a one principle which runs uh, through the entire fabric of the constitution, and that is the rule of law. And it is... Uh, it is, uh, it is the judiciary which is uh, entrusted with the task of keeping every organ 
that means the maintenance of the rule of law within the limits of law so what is the difference what is the definition of law we know all thereby making the rule of law very meaningful and effective as it is said that uh, judiciary as you mentioned it already the judiciary is the guardian of the constitution as well as judiciary is the sentinel of the democracy and uh, to achieve the these are all to achieve the justice these are all to achieve the uh, as you have said as you have mentioned the realization of the human rights i think this is the morality of the constitution this is the morality of the constitution so uh, my very simple question dr kumar uh, as because the law is to fulfill the purpose of the purpose of the society somebody has said about the corruption somebody has said about the transfer somebody has said about a different question has been raised against the judiciary uh, but question is the to maintain the it is the judiciary as because it is a judiciary is the sentinel of the dem democracy to maintain the rule of law to maintain the uh, independence of judiciary but my question very humble question that do you think that uh, this all this process all the mechanisms what we have been adopted Uh, for the purpose of independence of judiciary is going to be weakening the weakening the judiciary as because uh, so far i remember that uh, granville austin said the process of weakening the judiciary and bringing it under the thumb of the executive began with grievous blow to the democracy it was said by granville austin so now yes, my sir. question is um, throughout your study throughout your experience your observation what do you think that the process we are what we have been adopting now whatever it is uh, is it going to weakening the judiciary is it going to weakening the norms of the democracy is it going to weakening weakening the uh, norms of the rule of law this sir your question is uh, too simple but uh, yeah. we'll take you know long hour for a deliberation and discussions sir at the very beginning let me tell you that rule of law is a principle it is a doctrine you can say uh, you know it's a such kind of principle which must be remain present in any vibrant democratic country in any vibrant democratic legal you know institution such rule of law must be remain present now, now it is said, law, now, now, now it is said rule of life rule of yeah, law means rule, rule of, of life yes, rule of life see sir the term may change but the ethos of it it will remain the same let me tell you why this uh, independence of judiciary is so debated independence of judiciary itself has been so debated now everyone knows about the impartiality that the judge must act impartial not only to make the judge remain impartial in any case and without any fear without any influence he must discharge his duty and adjudicate just to have this particular thing the individual independence of judiciary has submerged with the collective independence of judiciary and entire institution is working out to create an environment now let me tell you one thing sir this is very practical in nature what your question is your question is so simple but it's having a very you know uh, having a pragmatic approach it's having a very value in the practical life uh i can you know, just give you some another example over here a very practical example like suppose uh, uh my kid i want my kid to be admitted in a school a school of nursery class so in any kg school i want my kid to get admitted i heard that the fact is that that it is very tough 
to take admission in that particular school now i got this information that the principal who was there he was a student of my university so i just tried to make a call to him yes you are my student my uh, child wants uh, an admission over there so kindly look after that i have not said that uh, what is the you know situation what is the fact i just said kindly look after that now as of a principal of the school now this is the practical thing now i am just floating this particular matter before all of us all of you that as of a principal of that school what he is supposed to do will he abide by the order of his teacher will he take into consideration the equality between all the students who are expected to take admission or will he only respect the duties which is you know assigned to his chair now the manner in which the person will find the answer that will the term determine what would be the nature of the independent jurisdiction and how we are going to you know uh, understand that particular term the idealism states that the person must associate itself to the chair and mm-hmm. discharge his duty without any influence of anywhere but in practicality same is happening with the judiciary let me tell you frankly same is happening in the appointment of judges practically speaking that means when when the you know these collegium system they try to take the uh, nomination of the advocates who will be appointed to the judge of the high court what is the uh, you know process the process is something else so in writing for saying something is there but in practice something else is there so now onwards the judiciary is trying so therefore now i have referred this very uh, nice judgment in 2019 and i am respecting you know the intent with which it was written that the judiciary is trying i cannot say you can have a perfect you know legal system what i can say what i am trying to say that there is a imperfectness in the in, in the legal system but with the with the uh, you know uh, the amalgamation or the when the joint efforts of executive the judiciary as well as legislature we can make it perfect it is not only the task of the judiciary to make or maintain the independence of judiciary it is it is equally you know equal responsibility casted on the legislature as well as as well as the executive to uphold the independence of judiciary as well as the rule of law this is a I think yeah. I would have satisfied you. Okay, okay. The another thing is, Dr. Kumar, yes. there always there is yes. a conflict in between individual interest and official interest. Okay. Yes. So uh, the judges uh, might have, one judge might have his own philosophy, the judge might have his own uh, will, and so uh, so on the other hand, official interest is there. So how to balance it? the when there is a conflict between the official interest and personal interest as because we are so you are you have already said about the individual interest in terms of the independence of judiciary so the individual interest how it is how it will be resolved uh, what's your opinion in this uh, regards please sir sir in the judgment which was written by a judge we don't read only the judgment the letter and the content we read the mind of the judge we read the consciousness of the judge the consciousness with which he is writing the judgment now so see in in administrative law uh, because because of your you sir you know i again i am remembering uh, professor late sanazwa sir because i had a discussion with him on the same issue it was on the administrative matter principle of natural justice and sir in the principle of natural justice when a judge is discharging his duty now it is his inner consciousness as shown by justice gajendra garkar that when the matter has came before him he himself has came forward and said that i am a member of that cooperative society and therefore i do i am not biased but there is a all likelihood of bias i refrain from deciding the matter 
so judge has to come forward when there is a conflict between the personal interest and the collective interest i think a judge must give primacy to the collective interest because private interest personal interest the in the in re the entire world the entire world not only the india the entire world is you know they have came to know about how the appointment has been done what has happened why not he has refrained from taking the office of, of that particular chair why not he has you know uh, uh, rejected the offer which was given by the executive so there are many questions which are yet unanswered but there are, these questions can be answered by the young generation these questions can be answered by the youngsters who are going to preside over the chair of the judiciary and they can they can imbibe within themselves the value they can imbibe within the, themselves the morality and those values those morality can be dictated in their judgment so uh, you know uh, it is said that that uh, Uh, the manner in which the matter can be decided the fate itself can be decided by the judge who has been brought up in a particular fashion how he has been brought up that can be seen over there but the role of judge is very difficult though we can you know we can appreciate any judgment we can criticize any judgment but the role of judge is very critical and it's uh, you know uh, i can say that means many things has to be taken into consideration to keep a persons impartial it's a very difficult task a very difficult task and i salute that those judges who really you know discharge their functions with impartiality holding the independence of judiciary and uh, with all the interest of you know giving the justice to all the people in need therefore sir uh, it's uh, you know all depends upon the personal value of the person how he is you not know, giving treatment to personal interest as well as the collective interest thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much sir thank you thoda uh, bora uh, sir you have given this opportunity to me to you know uh, be here and speak and share my wisdom before you as far as the appointment of judge and independence of judiciary is concerned hope that the questions which has been put over by uh, the participants i could be able to satisfy you and let me tell you very frankly even though i have not satisfied you try to read that no no it is not that no, <laughs> we are, we are no, highly sir. satisfied i used to you know say in the class that a teacher is also a student a teacher is also a student. for right. delivering this lecture let me tell you i am not you know a person you know who uh, who, who refrain from receiving any criticism but yes i can only share the truth before entering into a class i used to prepare a lot before you no know, coming before you i prepared a lot though i know about the subject matter i read this topic several times i have conducted the classes also no problem but still i used to practice to you know read prepare my Sir, it's a humble request to all the friends, whether you are student or a teacher. It's not so small. You can S P Gupta case. It was decided when S P Gupta case was decided. This case was you know partly overruled in another case, but this case you know reads out in near around seven hundred pages. So if you read the entire you no know, sentiment. of the judges the you know the decision which has been delivered each line will give you a new idea try to learn those idea and i i'll tell you that you will have so many ideas within you that you will you know you will face difficulty to how to handle all these idea all together topic is very vibrant and it's still in today and debate is not ended it is it's still open thanks to all thanks one and all once again thank you फैकल्टी प्लीज कैंडली फुट द क्वेश्चन टू सर पर्सनली I request 
Yes, Shibankar, I would like to put a question. Yes, Dr. Kaurav, yes, please. Yes, ma'am, you can take it over. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, sir. And yes, thank you for the lucid explanation, sir, you have provided. Because uh, I think that after hearing your you, I need to again revisit the provisions. All <laughs> Article 124, I need to revisit visit the provisions. I need to revisit the case laws. Because such a lucid explanation, uh, I would say your students are really genius because they get to know from you. So I just want to uh, just want to know one thing, as you said about Keshavnanda Bharti's case, yes, we know that uh, fundamental rights case. So uh, and in most of the cases, so we see that, that there is tussle for power between the parliament and the judiciary, that uh, we can say that parliamentary sovereignty versus judicial supremacy. Again, sir, on other hand, what uh, I feel, uh, what we see is that when the president is issuing ordinance, even that is subject to judicial review, sir. So then, uh, in your opinion, sir, do you think that there should be a direct uh, like accountability you have already thrown? So do, do you think that there should be direct system in the provision regarding the uh, this uh, selection, uh, the system of judging? There should be any system of judging the judges? Or so you think that constitutionalism which is imbibed in the constitution is more than enough, sir. So just this came to my mind. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you that uh, I respect the Indian constitution and the term in the preamble which has really, I still find myself in that particular word, word called we. So, being a citizens of India, I think all of all of us are having this responsibility to respect the constitution. Now, as far as the already in the, all the deliberation, I was saying that that the content of the Article 124 and 217 is different. Now, due to the judicial interpretation, it has become a little more different. Like, you know, happens in the case of Article 21, you can read Article 14, 15, 16. Even the structure of the Indian Constitution has been changed by constitutional amendment. So legislature is also having a part. If they are, if they are working, if they are exercising their power within the constitutional limit, then constitutional structure can be changed. Same way, judiciary is also, the judiciary is not above the law. Judiciary is not above the constitution. Judiciary is within the constitutional in the mechanism. They have to, even the judiciary is respected. They have the, uh, you know, the mandate principle norms which has been laid down by the constitution. I'm floating one example over here with regard to ADM Jabalpur. It's a very long you know, case, ADM Jabalpur, because I have referred this case in the slides, therefore I am just referring this particular case. Now tell me, why dissenting opinion of Justice H.R. Khanna has resulted into constitutional? As of a citizen, do you find that, that the judgment of a HR Khanna is more attractive, protective in nature compared to the majority with ADM Jabalpur case. Hello. <coughs> so ADM Jabalpur case, the dissenting opinion itself, the citizens of India, they got attraction toward the dissenting opinion shared by Justice HR Khanna. And it was respected by the legislature too. Such kind of an you know, environment we need in the present scenario, where something is you know recommended, which is appealing to all the, which is you no know, for the welfare of the citizens, which is for promoting the fundamental rights, gardening the fundamental rights of the citizens. If the legislatures are coming forward, it is welcome. When the judiciary, because see, this Dashal itself has a given, hmm, given the uh, glaring example. 
Ballav Keshavan. <coughs> this is that Parliament, if they want, they can amend anything. Even the Parliament, they wanted to amend the fundamental right also. Now, if suppose your fundamental right get amended, if your fundamental right get amended, if your fundamental right is not secured, then how you can secure your constitution? And therefore, the judiciary has came forward. So it's a you cannot say that all the machinery should work all together. What I said, I can say that there must be, there must be, you know, uh, disagreement. There must be, there should be disagreement. There should be disagreement. But disagreement does not mean that there must be disrespect to the institution. Disagreement does not mean that there is a disrespect to the institution. This, uh, you know, if there is a uh, uh, no agreement, if there is a disagreement, it means that that you are having a strong public opinion. The people are having this power of freedom of speech and expression to express themselves, their resistance that yes, we are not agreeing with the system which which are you know coming forward. Now we are expressing ourselves whether we should go with the commission model, we, are, we can go with the collegium model. Let me tell you, both the system are not good enough because what has been written in the Indian constitution is very fair that the president will, is having a power and the president will appoint the judge of the Supreme Court in consultation with. Only the question is regarding the consultation. The constituent assembly thought that, that these two constitutional machineries, sorry, these two constitutional functionaries, they will consult among each other. They will arrive at a, you know, harmonious agreement with regard to appointment of constitution. They have not thought there will be a kind of a touch which we are, which we have, you know, uh, evidented. So even if this tussle dispute has arisen, then that dispute, dispute, that, you know, thing has to be resolved out. And I think that, the the uh, you know the outcome of 2019 judgment which has rested its you know uh, periphery with regard to openness transparency hmm? and even the judicial uh, collision system which you know the the uh, correspondence which has been made hmm, in the collision system that has to be kept in the public domain i think it's a very well uh, declared judgment it's very well declared judgment so slowly, slowly, see, if some vices will come in society, instantly it will not go away. It will take time. It will take, you know, social participation. It will take political participation. It will take, you know, uh, economic participation. Many factors it will take. And then you will have a, like, you know, you used to wash your uh, clothes in in uh, washing machine. You have to switch it on. So that all these dirts, vices will go away. You have to put something, you have to pour, you know, you have to mix something. So this mixing, like, you know, putting I, some this de de uh, detergent, I, that de detergent, we are just shaking uh, and trying to find I, I, which model will be the one. I'm not able to hear you. Please kindly, you know. Hello. <clears throat> Yes, sir. We are on. You are audible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm audible. Yeah. Yes. Is there any other question from faculty side? Thank you, Dr. Korobi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Korobi, you. Thank That's a nice question. Thank you, Korobi, ma'am. And thank thanks. you, every, thank all you. the participants. So, thanks to all. In case if you are having any kind of a doubt, if you do have any kind of a questions to me, kindly, you know, you can mail me out or you can yes, reach yes, me sir, out. Yes, sir, I wanted, yes. sir, uh, sir, sorry to interrupt. I was, I was, one, I was, asked, means, uh, ready to ask you this question. That, sir, can you send all the uh, questions to the mail? Because there are so many questions. Multiple questions came in the chat box. So I can mail you the question. Uh, yeah, I, I am, I am. Mailing my mail ID as well yes, as yes, sharing my Hello. mobile yes, number. Hello. Hello. The, Hello. Share the mail ID, then student will directly can ask you the question. Hello. Yes. Hello. Jaita. So due to I've shared my uh, I've shared my mail ID. 
my okay, calling okay. calling Thank number you, and sorry. my whatsapp number so you can uh, whatsapp me your you can whatsapp me your feedback what, uh, which slide you don't like or which part of my you know deliberation you don't like kindly share that part because sir, even students, I'm a learner, sir, I'm, students ask <laughs> that they need your slide they have come to know so many things from your slide so they are asking to share your slide so you have given them the uh, whatsapp number and uh, this uh, particular email id also so student i will that. i will share my slides with only one request not to be put on the social media if that will be assured i can share my slides because on these slides i do have a copyright <laughs> yes, 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 sir. <laughs> sure, sir, sure, sir. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Fibankar, for uh, running this you, question hour so nicely. So, now I, I would like to introduce the reporter of our today's session, uh, um, Mrs. Sharmista Das and Mrs. Mahfuja Anjum Soikya are the reporters for our today, today's uh, session. So, now I would like to call upon Mrs. Sharmista Das to give a brief report of our today's session. A very warm good afternoon. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes you are audible. OK. A very warm good afternoon to everyone. Today's event commenced with a warm welcome to the keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Priya Ranjan Kumar, Associate Professor, HOD, Department of Law, Tejpur University, Assam, and Professor Ramesh Chandra Borpotra Gohai, Advocate General, former Dean, Faculty of Law, Guwahati University. Dr. Rihana Sultana Chaudhary, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, proceeded with the introduction of our esteemed guest, Professor Ramesh Chandra Borpotra Gohai. The inaugural speech was then delivered by him, which was tributed to the works of late Professor Norim uh, Sonojoba. Professor Rihana Sultana Chaudhary then proceeded with the introduction of Dr. Priya Ranjan Kumar. Dr. Priya Ranjan Kumar then took over the session. He explained the meaning of independence of judiciary and its importance. He threw light on various constitutional provisions relating to independence of judiciary. He then discussed about various benchmark judgments like Keshavanan Bharti, S.H. Shed versus Union of India, S.P. Gupta versus Union of India, and many more in the context of independence of judiciary. He discussed about the acknowledgement and reiteration of independence of judiciary as a basic structure of Indian constitution. He talked about various recommendations put forwarded by the Law Commission for setting up of Independent Appointment Commission. He also discussed about the object, scope, and important provision of the National Judicial Appointment Commission Act 2014 in a detailed and vivid fashion. He concluded the session with the deeper aspect of the topic, which was highly informative and beneficial. Then, Ms. Pilbankar Pashwat, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College, opened the platform for interactive session where doubts from the attendees were entertained by the resource person. Now, I shall ask Dr. Rihana Sultana Chaudhary to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Rihana, ma'am? Uh, Hello. Thank you, Sir Mr. for giving such uh, brief report for our today's session. Thank you so much. So now we are at the end of the session, and I feel it as my great privilege to propose the vote of thanks for our today's lecture session. I, on behalf of the NEF Law College, and on my own behalf extend my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our Honorable Professor Dr. Ramesh Chandra Barpatta Guhai, Advocate General Government of Assam, for raising our program with his invaluable, informative, and inspiring words amidst his busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our today's resource person, Dr. Piyaranjan Kumar, 
associate professor and head department of law tejpur university for delivering a very thought provoking and knowledge oriented speech it was a mesmerizing speech sir thank you so much sir for sharing your scholarly findings and opinions with us i hope that our participants have got many valuable legal information from your deliberations next i want to say that a program like this cannot happen overnight it requires effort dedication implementation strategy and for this i would like to express my deep sense of gratitude and thank thanks to our principal dr bhuvan chandra borua nef law college for his scholarly advice untired initiative and strenuous effort to materialize these ideas in the, into reality thank you so much sir for your effort to make it a, it a reality i also take the opportunity to express my gratitude and thanks to dr Hello, Rehana, madam. You are not audible. 